Hi, this is Zam 135, Layout in Xamarin Forms. When you're doing layout of your views, it's tedious to calculate the size and position of everything on your own. It's much easier to say something high level like, please arrange my views in a single column and automatically resize them whenever the device rotates. To do that kind of a, a service, Xamarin Forms has four layout panels that come in the box stack, grid, absolute, and relative. And all of these own a collection of children, and their job is to calculate the size and position of those children, and, and of course recalculate as things change, like the size of an element changes. For example, if you change the text on a label, that would force a recalculation, or if you rotate the device, again, a recalculation happens. In this course, we're gonna cover stack layout and grid layout. Those are probably the most flexible and, and most common panels that people start with. Absolute layout and relative layout are also useful, but they're much more specialized. Let's start with a, a core concept here. The actual size that a view ends up is a collaboration between the view and the panel that contains it. So here we have a view sitting inside a panel. And, and the core idea is that the, the view isn't the one that's really in control. The view says, my preferred size is this, but then the panel is the one that has the final decision. If we look a little bit more deeply into this idea, the, the interchange between the panel and the view goes something like this. The panel calculates how much size it could give the view based on its size, and it says to the view, okay, I can give you up to this size. These are the constraints that you have to work with. The view then replies and says, in that case, given the constraints you're giving, you're giving to me, I'd like to be this size. And then it's the panel again that makes the final decision. Here I have a label with some text, and absent other factors, this label will size itself just around its content. So it'll be like it's shrink wrapped around its text. We'll see a lot of other factors that influence size, but this sort this is sort of the base case. Absent other factors, views tend to size themselves just large enough to hold their content. So remember that a view and the layout panel do this little collaboration to, to figure out the size and position. The way the view does this is by setting four properties that express its preferences to the panel. Width request and height request define its preferred size. And notice the word request. These are just requests that could be overruled by the layout panel. And then vertical and horizontal options define where the view gets laid out within the rectangle that the container allocates for it. Here's some code showing width request and height request. Notice that these are set on the view itself, like in this case, a label but it's the container that decides whether or not these values can be respected. The example we just saw used numbers like 100. And, and notice that there's no units on that expression. And in fact, in Xamarin Forms, there are no units that are intrinsic to the values that you see here. Instead, th those values get in passed to and interpreted by the platform. So that'll get that number 100 will get passed straight through to the underlying platform where the, the, the app is executing. They'll be interpreted as effective pixels in Windows, points in iOS, or density independent pixels in Android. Here's an example. Suppose we have 100 by 300. And, the, and suppose that the panel actually respects those unit sizes and, and it does end up using 100 by 300. If we run this on a Windows device, in this case, a, a five inch Win 10 device, the operating system will calculate a scale factor, which it will then apply to the values that we see there in our Xamarin Forms label. So in this case, it'll be rendered at 200 by 600 physical pixels because this device uses a scale factor of two. We'll get the same result on an iPhone 6S. If we look, run it on a device that has a higher pixel density, for example, a Nexus 6, that has a scale factor of 3.5. So you can see it's gonna be rendered at 350 by 1050 physical pixels. After the calculation and this little dance happens between the view and the layout panel, the view will end up having some size. It may or may not be the size that the view requested, right? But at runtime, it will end up having a, a size. And those values are available to your app. XY tell you where the thing got laid out within its parent container. 
and then width and height tell you the size that it ended up. And note that those are in the platform independent units that we just discussed, so they're not, the values are not in physical pixels. There's a convenience property that wraps up all four of those values into a single rectangle, and it's just x, y, width, height. The next thing that a view can specify are its layout options in both the horizontal and vertical directions. And the meaning and the interpretation of these, again, is based on the panel that contains this view. These are stored in the view, again, and interpreted by the container. Both of those are type layout options, and if you look inside layout options, there are two properties in there. The first one's relatively intuitive. Again, remember where we're deciding where the view gets placed within the rectangle that the container gives it. So start, center, end, and fill control how it's aligned within that rectangle. And you have two of these, you have horizontal and vertical, so you can control where within the rectangle the view gets placed. The other one, expands, is a little trickier. That gets used only by stack layout, and, and it controls whether or not the view gets extra space allocated to it if the stack layout actually has extra space. And, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Here's a visual representation of the alignment. We are just doing the horizontal here, notice, and we have four labels, and their, their text shows you what the horizontal options are set to. So start ends up over here on the left, center here, and here obviously, and then fill occupies the entire rectangle. I, th I think the way to think about this is try to envision the container's rectangle. So this first label here, start, the rectangle that the container gave it spans the full width and then within that rectangle, the view, notice how it's sized, right? it's sized just to wrap around its text, is positioned at the left edge in the horizontal direction of that rectangle. And start and end are analogous. Fill is, is more interesting in some ways because notice that fill doesn't really impact the position, it more changes the size of the view. It says, please have this view occupy the entire rectangle that was given to it by its container, in this case, the stack layout. Notice that these are called start and end and not something language specific like left and right. The location of start and end would be reversed if you were using a right to left language. Uh, an option of fill controls or impacts the size of a view. Now we have an interesting case. I have a width request and then I have a horizontal options. Notice how these things are, are kind of in conflict in the sense that both of these are asking for a horizontal size. And so we have two properties that impact the size in this case, and one of them has to take precedence. And it is fill that wins. So when you have a horizontal option of fill, generally that takes precedence over with requests. And similarly, if I had a vertical options of fill, that would take precedence over a height request. The reason that's important is because fill is the default. So for example here, I have two labels. These definitions are equivalent. I don't say anything here, but horizontal and vertical options are both defaulting to fill. If you need to do a minor adjustment to the way things are positioned, you can use margin. Margin adds extra space around the outside of your view. The type of margin is, is actually a struct called thickness, and there's three different ways to create them. Here's the first one. It's left, comma, top, right, and bottom. Here's the second one. The first value is used for left and right, second value for top and bottom, and finally, a single value would get used on all four sides. Padding is different than margin. Padding, first of all, only applies to layout containers. So a stack layout has padding, a grid has padding, but the individual views like button and label and so on do not have padding. Padding means extra space around the inside of the container. If this outer box, in this case, is the stack layout, the padding decreases the amount of room within the stack layout where the children can be placed. This is exercise number one. There's no code to write, you're just executing a pre-existing application that we've supplied. This app has eight buttons here. All the buttons have click handlers installed that change the layout options of this label down here. Here's the code behind. Notice the event handlers just look at the target, that's the label, and change the vertical or horizontal options. Finally, so this label has a width and height request of 150. When we run this, this is what it looks like. Notice that the height request is being respected 
by the stack layout here containing the label, but the width request isn't. The label, its horizontal options are defaulting to fill, which means the width request is being ignored. If I start clicking these buttons up here, you can see if I click fill, nothing happens because that's the default, but the others will impact the width. As soon as I start doing start, center, or end, the horizontal options are no longer fill, which means the width request of 150 starts getting respected. This is a vertical stack layout, and in the vertical direction, stack, a vertical stack layout ignores the vertical options. So if I click these, start, center, end, fill, nothing happens. Stack layout arranges its children in either a single column like we see here or a single row. It has a collection of children that it inherits from its base class layout and it constrains the generic parameter there to be view. If you need to build your UI dynamically, you can work with the children collection here from code. It's an iList, so it has an add method. You can also add children in XAML. The children collection is the content property for layouts. So when we nest children like this inside a panel, these automatically get added to the children collection. Most of the time we're gonna use XAML here because generally for building a UI, it's more common than code, unless you're in a case where you need to build your UI dynamically. The order that you list the children is significant. It determines that the, the order that they get laid out at runtime. You can set the spacing property. Here you can see we're leaving a nice little gap between each of the children. The default is six, but you can set it to anything that you need. And you can choose between or orientation vertical and orientation horizontal. Vertical is the default, so you can see the children are laid out vertically here, set it to horizontal, and you get the other direction. Generally, stack layout does respect the, the layout options, but there's a lot of cases here to think about. So let's do the most basic one first. Here we have a vertical stack layout. So the children are arranged here top to bottom. In this case, the stack layout will respect the horizontal options of start, center, end, and fill. And you can see how that's working here. In the direction of its orientation though, those four options are not used. So for example, here we have a vertical stack layout and we're looking at vertical options. In this case, start, center, end, and fill are completely ignored. Stack layout offers a, a thing called expansion, which is actually a little bit tricky. Notice that in this case, we have a vertical stack layout here. So we have three children laid out vertically. And then down here at the bottom, we have some extra space. The children inside the stack layout can say to the stack layout, if you end up having some extra room, please give me some of it. In this case, two of the children ask for expansion, but one does not. So we have this much leftover space down here. That space gets divided evenly among all the children that ask for expansion. The stack layout expands only in one direction, and that is the direction that matches its orientation. So in the vertical direction, it will expand its children vertically. In order to do expansion, the stack layout has to actually figure out how high all its children would be if it wasn't expanding. And the way it does that is just, it just uses its normal layout algorithm to determine the height of each one of its children. So for example here, I have a label with a height request. So since it has a height request, this will be respected in this direction. Right? Vertical stack layout will respect height request. And then down here I have a height request as well, so those two will be used. In the middle here, I don't have a height request. So that one's gonna use what, we call, what we're calling its default size. And by default size, I just mean that in the absence of things like widths and height requests, how big would the child size itself? And in this case, labels, uh, labels size themselves just to fit around their content, in this case, that text there. So this is the first thing the stack layout does. It calculates, like in this, this is a vertical stack layout, so it would calculate how big, how tall it would be absent expansion requests. Once it that does that, then it looks at all the children that have requested expansion. The way a child requests expansion is using these right here layout options. And remember the, the expansion is in the same direction as orientation. So we have a vertical stack layout here. Children that would like expansion 
should set their vertical options to one of these four options, start, center, end, and fill, but make sure they include the and expand part. Behind the scenes, remember these things are instances of the layout option struct, and inside the layout option struct there are two fields. There's an alignment field, and that's what the start, center, end, and fill gets used to set. And then there's a boolean expands. So adding the and expand here just sets that underlying boolean flag to true. Here's the trickiest part about expansion. When, when a child expands, what that really does is allocate extra room to the rectangle that is given to that child. It doesn't necessarily change the, chi the, the size of the child itself. So let's look at four cases here. So suppose I have this child here, this orange box, and after expansion, its rectangle grows to be this size. If I use the start and expand layout option, the size of the child does not change. It just, it just gets laid out here at the top of its layout rectangle. The next child will get laid out down here now, below that extra room. So it'll, it'll be as if there was extra space, an extra gap between this child and the next one. Center and end are similar. The one that's different is fill. So if you have fill and expand, then the child will grow to occupy the entire space here of the expanded rectangle. Here we have a vertical stack layout. Notice we're setting the horizontal options. A vertical stack layout only expands in the vertical direction. It does not expand in the horizontal direction. That means for the horizontal options, the and expand part is completely irrelevant. And in fact, start is the same as start and expand, center is the same as center and expand. In other words, in the direction opposite of its orientation, the and expand part is completely ignored. Here's exercise number two. The goal is to produce this output over here, produce a UI that looks like this. And you only use stack layout to do it. Now you can use as many stack layouts as you need, and that's really the trick here. Use nested stack layouts that are horizontal to build the individual pieces here. Let's just look at the solution quickly. Our main stack layout here is vertical. That's the default orientation. Then nested inside that, we have a series of horizontal stack layouts. Here's the first one. So that chunk controls this right here the label that says bill, and then this entry control that says enter the amount of the restaurant bill. This next piece is very similar. Really, the only difference here is we've added a little bit of margin. Just to put a little bit of space, this gap you see right here is from that margin. Remember, this is left, top, right, and bottom. So the 20 units is on top of this stack layout. Right. This next one is very similar. Nothing new there. This next one's interesting. So this says, we, we do want a horizontal stack layout again, and it does produce this down here, the tip percentage and the 15%. The interesting part is the vertical options, end and expand. So of the children of the main stack layout here, this is the only one that asks for expansion. All the extra space is given to this stack layout right here. Okay, and remember, when, when something expands, what the extra space is given to is the rectangle for that child, not necessarily the child itself. Then within that rectangle, we select end, which means this entire stack layout here is right here. It's at the bottom of the expanded rectangle, and I'll try to trace out with my mouse here what I think the rectangle looks like. So expansion gave all this extra room right here to the rectangle for this stack layout, and then the end part aligned the, that stack layout at the bottom of this expanded rectangle. After that, we have a slider that's occupying this whole space here. Nothing interesting going on in that one. And then we have two more stack layouts, both horizontal, and there's a little bit interesting here with the center and expand. So the center and expand has two effects. Right, first, we, we have both children asking for expansion, which means the extra room is going to get split equally between them. And then we have center, which means that the button itself here 
gets laid out in the center of the expanded rectangle. The final stack layout here is completely analogous to the one we just looked at. So we can build a fairly reasonable looking UI here solely using stack layout. We're going to take a very short detour now and talk about attached properties. This is a special kind of property that's defined in one class but applied to objects of other classes. I have a button here for my example. If you look at the documentation for button, you will not find a property named row, nor will you find one named column. Those properties are actually defined over in the grid class. You take settings for this property, like here I have grid.row equals one, grid.column equals two, and you attach those values to a, something like a button. So here we have, again, a property that's not defined in button, but I have a setting for it attached to a button. You can have multiple properties attached from all sorts of different classes. Here I have one from grid, one from absolute layout, one from relative layout. Behind the scenes, basically these values get loaded into a dictionary that stores key value pairs where you can think of grid.row as the key and one as the value. They just sit in that dictionary unless someone comes along and looks up whether or not they're there. So for example, if I were to place this button in a grid, then the grid cares about those attached property settings and it will go over to the button and ask it whether it has settings for row and column attached properties. If so, the grid will use those values here, row equals one, column equals two, to determine where this child gets placed in the grid. If there aren't values for row and column on the child, they'll just default to zero in this case. Anything else, any other attached properties that aren't relevant to grid, those will just get ignored. Here's a little peek behind the scenes. Generally, as the consumer of an attached property, you don't have to worry about these things, but it's, it's mildly interesting just to see a little bit of what goes on behind the scenes here. So I have two classes from the Xamarin Form source code, bindable property and bindable object. This is where the infrastructure is to implement attached properties. There's a registration method there in bindable property, and then there's the backing store in bindable object. Again, if you think of this as really implemented using something like a dictionary, these get value and set value methods just manipulate that dictionary behind the scenes to add or look up values. As the consumer of an attached property though, this is what you're gonna be looking at. So here I have the grid class and it has kind of three things. First thing is the definition of the property itself. Notice we're defining the row property here, but the actual name of this field is row with the suffix property. And that convention is universally followed. And then you have get set methods. Again, notice the naming convention, get row and set row. These are the things that you're going to be using as a client of a, this attached property. If you're doing this in code, you're just going to call the get and set methods directly. So here I have a button and I want to attach a setting for grid.row equals one to this button. I call the set row method. Remember that method is static. So I call it on the class name and I'm attaching it to that object right there. There's some special syntax to do it in XAML. You use the name of the class and then the name of the field without the property suffix. So it's this word right here, not the whole thing, not row property, just the first part of it, row. So grid.row is what you use in XAML and then just assign equal to the value. A grid is made up of a bunch of rows and columns and then you put children into the cells formed by those rows and columns. And a child can occupy a single cell or the child can span across multiple columns or multiple rows or both, like in this example here. It's your job to define what the grid's gonna look like. So you have to define both the rows and the columns. You have three options for each. The simplest is a fixed value. For, so for a row, you would say fixed height. A fancier option is automatically adapt to the content. So for example, you can say, I would like this row to be as tall as the height of the tallest child. And the last option is proportional sizing. So for example, you could say, I would like to take all the remaining space, split one third, two thirds between these remaining two rows. The column definitions are completely analogous, except of course you would be defining the width rather than the height. Behind the scenes, here are the classes that you use to actually define the rows and columns. For a row, you specify the height, and for a column, it's the width. And notice these things are actually grid length objects. So this is, this is a struct we'll look at in a moment. It's not as simple as a double because it has to handle all three of the cases we just looked at. Inside grid length, there are two properties. One is the type, 
And, and this type of, are those three options we saw a minute ago. So absolute, which is fixed size, auto, which is the automatically adjust to the height of the tallest child, and then star, which is the proportional sizing. There's also a double. So for example, when you were, if you were gonna use absolute sizing, you would set grid unit type to absolute, and then the double here value to the, the number of platform independence you would like for the absolute size. We'll see some code next on how that works for all three cases. Here's the absolute case. I have both code and XAML here. So in code, you create a row definition object, set its height to a grid length. There's a constructor that just takes a double here. So this value will be put in that double property named value, and this is automatically gonna set the uh, unit type to absolute. In XAML, it's simpler. You just say height at equal 100, and again, this is always in the platform independent units. The auto case is, is a little bit more interesting. In code, you're gonna set the height to a grid length object, and you're gonna use this other constructor here that takes a value and the unit type. The unit type's definitely gonna be auto. Here's the interesting bit, though. The value is irrelevant here, and so by convention, everyone just uses one, and that's what you should do as well. If you're doing it in XAML, you don't have to specify the value, you just use the special term auto. The last one is star sizing or proportional sizing. Create a grid length object. This is the same constructor we saw a moment ago. This is the value, and for the unit type, you use star. In XAML, there's a special shorthand right, for the value, and then you use an asterisk, which means star. It's a small note here. One star and star are equivalent. The grid contains two collections, one for the columns and one for the rows, and you have to create column definition objects and add them to, to that collection, create row definitions, and add it to this collection. Here's an example for the rows. This is the same conceptual example we saw earlier, now with code. So first one would be a fixed height of 100, so we would have a row definition object inside that collection and set the height to 100. That gives us absolute sizing. Here's auto sizing. We want this to automatically adjust to the height of the tallest child, so height equals auto. And then for these last two rows, we're gonna use star sizing or proportional sizing. So height equals one star, height equals two star. That's a one third, two thirds split. So again, first the grid is gonna compute the how much space is available. So it's gonna look at this height right here, right? all the rows that don't use star sizing, compute whatever space is left over and then divide that with a one-third, two-thirds split. Row and column definitions default to one star. If we define our rows this way and our columns this way, what we're gonna end up with is a uniform grid because the space in both cases will be divided evenly. Row and column numbers start at zero. To position a child within the grid, use these attached properties. There's row and column for positioning and then row span and column span for sizing. Here's the positioning. So I'm, I have a child view here that I wanna to add to this grid. I say grid.row equals one, grid.column equals zero, and that'll place the child right there. Here's an example of span. We're just gonna do column span. Okay, column span equals two. So notice it spans across one, two columns. Row and column default to zero, and the spans default to one. So if I just use this right here, I have a child and I don't specify any of the sizing or positioning attached properties, it's gonna end up here, row zero, column zero, with a span in, in both direction of one. So it'll just occupy that single cell. Grid does respect horizontal and vertical options and they control how the view is positioned within its cell. Right here I have a child, that's 50 by 50, and we're gonna assume that the cell here is larger than 50 by 50. In that case, the horizontal and vertical options are gonna make sense, so horizontal will be centered here, and then vertically, it'll be end, so it's gonna be down here. The default is fill, and fill means expand to the entire size of the cell. And remember, you have horizontal and vertical separate, so if you set horizontal options equals fill, it would fill the entire width of the cell, but not the height, unless you then set vertical options to fill as well. You can control the spacing in both the row and column directions. There's the row spacing, there's the column spacing, both of those default to six. Grid inherits a children collection from its base class here layout. However, in layout, the type of the children collection is iList. So here, 
grid redefines the children collection. So it uses the new keyword here in this position that means hides or shadows, and it uses I grid list for the type instead of just I list. This includes a bunch of add methods that are specialized for adding children to a grid. That interface actually has several methods. We'll just do two of the most common here. The first one is pretty intuitive. You call add, and instead of just passing in the child, you also pass in the column and the row def or the row values. So this says position this child at that column and that row within the grid. Internally, they will set those attached properties for you. This one is a little more complex. This lets you set the row, column, row span, and column span all at once. So you call add, you pass in the view, of course, and then these two values define both the, the column setting and the column span. And, and behind the scenes, the math they do is they take whatever value this is and they subtract off that number right there. So when I did this, I tried to make this intuitive by using column plus one here. So you can see immediately that if you take this expression, subtract off that value, you're gonna get a column span of one. And similarly here, when you take that and subtract off this value, you get a row span of two. If you don't specify row and column definitions, grid, generates them automatically for you. And the way it does that is by looking at the row and column settings on all the children. So for example here, we have row equals one, row equals two. Since the, the values for row start at zero, this implies that there are three rows. And in fact, you know, basically the, the grid just looks at the maximum number here, adds one to that, and uses that as the number of rows that it auto-generates. Here, same thing goes on for the columns. This will have two columns. The rows that it generates are equal sized, which means that in practice, this is unlikely to generate the, the shape of the grid that you want, but it can be useful for prototyping or test code. Here's exercise three. The goal here is to produce this user interface using only a single grid. I have the solution up here. Let's start right here with the columns. I have two columns and they both use star sizing and they use the same value for star there. So that's one star, which means the, the horizontal width is going to be split equally. And if you look at the user interface here, you can see a line right down the middle here that defines the column zero and column one. The rows are more interesting here. Most of the rows are auto sized with just row let's see, zero, one, two, three, row three using star sizing. What that means is these rows here and these rows here are gonna automatically adjust to the height of their tallest child. All the remaining space will be allocated to that row. These two elements here go in row zero and then column zero and column one. So that's the label bill over here on the left in column zero and the entry field in column one. These next four views are similar. That's just these two labels on the left and these two labels on the right. These are more interesting. Notice these are grid row equals three and then column zero, column one. So that's the label over here and the label over here. So the interesting bit here is that they're both set vertical options equal end. Remember, this is row three, so it gets all the extra space. So row three is really tall. Again, I'm gonna try to trace out with my mouse here how big I think row three is. So it's all this space here, up to and including these two labels. Then within each of these cells, so I have two cells that are very tall here, right? Within each of these cells, I have these two labels and they have their vertical options set to end, which means they're positioned at the bottom in the vertical direction. And then the horizontal options, I have one of them start, which means tip percentage here is all the way to the left. And then the actual percentage here is set to end, which means it's pushed all the way over to the right. Next, I have the slider. That's also interesting because it has a column span, right? Column span of two, which means it spans across two columns. So it starts in column zero here and then spans across through column one. And these last four views don't have anything significant in them. They just have uh, row and column settings. So notice that with just a single grid, we can build a fairly interesting user interface. Our final item is a quick discussion of scrolling. 
the containers like stack layout, grid, and so on do not have scrolling built in. If you want scrolling, you have to include a scroll view in your UI. Scroll view has a single child. Typically, that child would be a layout container, but it can be any view for which you want to add scrolling. Here's how it works. You have a scroll view and nested inside the scroll view is the single piece of content that you want it to scroll. In this example, I have a stack layout. You're going to get an indicator here when you're actually scrolling the content. In this case, you can see that the indicator is really tall. It goes all the way down to here. That gives the user some intuition about how much content there is. A really tall scroll indicator like this means there's not very much extra content. If the scroll indicator were smaller, it would tell you that, that the amount of content was quite large. You can control the scrolling direction. The default is vertical, but you can choose horizontal or both. In this case, we've chosen both because we have a really large image that we want the user to be able to scroll around. And we get a vertical scrolling indicator here and a horizontal one here. And finally, here's just a quick piece of advice. Generally, you shouldn't nest scrolling. So for example, you wouldn't want to do something like this. You wouldn't want to have a scroll view here and then nested inside it a control like list view. List view is one of the few things here that actually supplies scrolling. So we have scrolling outside and scrolling inside, which leads to some confusing uh, user interactions. 